Good morning, YouTube. And here comes trouble. It's been a while. Been a little busy. But it's alright. I've got plenty of projects lined up for you. I did tease that we got a Ferrari coming up. That's easily going to be like a three or four day project, so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. I'll tease you a little. And in the meantime, we're going to work on a set of Raylar heads for a buddy of mine. I happen to have a new set that came in from him. And I'm going to do the 716 stud conversion. I'll go through the process with that with you guys. The same thing would apply to the older small block Chevys. There's some other applications where you'd machine a cylinder head for screw and studs. Maybe an old small block Ford as well. Then I'll talk about some of the other upgrades I'll do. Uh, it's a little unusual to see somebody doing it inside of a milling machine like this back here. Most of the time you'll see somebody do a screw and stud conversion in a seat and guide machine, which I don't own anymore. I've had a couple of them and they're really great to have. Except, once upon a time, I sold everything and just bought that one machine. Considering I'm just a hobby machinist these days, cue the comments, this is working out just fine for me. I'm already set up to do the 716 stud conversion. Big block Chevys have a uh, canted valve angle of about 4 degrees. We're going to bolt the railer head directly to this fixture. This is a fixture sold by uh, CP Motorworks in Janesville, Wisconsin. That's a good friend of mine. This is easily the most useful tool that you can have for doing automotive machine work. Bridgeport or not, if you, if you own a shop you're doing, or you're doing machine work at home, uh, you, you want to add some more capability to your setup, this is easily the best money you can ever spend. And to the dismay of all the YouTube machining experts, we're going to do everything using this drill chuck. We're going to do our drilling and tapping using this. You're not supposed to grab a tap with a drill chuck technically, but this isn't the most precise job in the world. It's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. We've skinned this cat before, my friends. And just to be safe, I asked the head of Mimir, and he was okay with it. It's about 5 in the morning. Got my coffee. Here's a Raylar head, ready to come out of the box. I'll show you exactly how they come, and give you a little bit better example of how they look right out of the box. The 8.1 video ended up being one of my more popular videos, so this might be pretty cool for you guys to see. Uh, these heads already come with factory 8.1 rocker studs, they come with guide plates. Uh, there's even some ARP head bolts that are supposed to come with this. So we'll unpack this and get a good look at this before we tear it apart and start modifying things. You know, since that's one of my favorite things, I like to take nice and expensive heads and void the warranty. It's kind of my MO. Last time you saw me, I was talking about maybe getting to 10,000 subs by the end of the year. Well, it's been about two weeks since you've seen the last video. We're at 12,000 and some change. Uh, so I think my main goal is to blow up and then act like I don't know nobody. Easily one of the most triggering things for all the YouTube experts was uh, I was grabbing that spring cutter tool with the, uh, that spring pad tool with the drill chuck. They all said that I needed to use a collet, but here's the thing. So let's go grab a collet. Let's take a look at this. This is a collet. These will get you, you know, a few ten thousandths of accuracy. Very good tools. Ideally, you'd grab everything you uh, want to run in your mill using one of these. Except, your typical spring pocket cutter has a three-sided shank. That's designed to be grabbed by a drill chuck, which happens to have three jaws if I knew which direction to spinny the worky parts. While you could grab one of these using a standard collet, one of the issues with that is that the tool's probably going to spin as soon as you engage the cutter. You know, there's a lot of surface area on, on this. What, what's more likely to happen is the tool will end up spinning and it'll end up being uh, caught inside of the splits. The splits aren't an accurately machined uh, feature on this part here. As soon as it spins, eh, you lost your accuracy. I'd take my bets on spinning it with a chuck before grabbing it improperly with a collet. So that's my response for you YouTube experts. I don't blame you. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Better get a drink before this gets cold. Here we go. That is quite a box. And I am a fan of a good box. Not a fan of the bubble wrap, though. Not really 
what I'd like to see. But the head is just fine. Let's see if I can't one hand this. Come on. You can. Hey, look. I didn't know those were in there. So if you order ARP head bolts, I think that's how they come inside of the Raylar box. Kind of would have been nice to be in, inside of an ARP box, but I'm cool with it. We'll just put those over there. Let's finish taking this out. This thing's a little sharp. Would have liked to see some chamfering there, but I can go ahead and do that in post machining. Oh, we found a head gasket. Wish I knew that was in there as well. Here's a look at your stock valves. These come from SI valves. That's a two inch 190, one inch 750 valve combo. They have an 11 32nd stem. This is all stuff that we've already talked about. So we're not gonna do a peer review today. We'll get this ripped apart, put it up in the machine and we'll go do the 7 16 rocker conversion and move on to Ferrari things. There's a look at your stock stud mount rocker system and the factory valve springs for the railar heads. Like I said before, they use a seven degree taper on the retainer. Uh, these are pretty generic parts. I don't know where the spring comes from, but I think it's a BBB spring in Argentina. When I put these back together after the rocker stud conversion, I'm going to put them together with some comp valve springs. We'll add a little bit more spring pressure and change this over to a 10 degree valve lock. So a couple things on disassembly that's worth noting. It looks like they struggled to get the heads assembled without damaging the keeper grooves. Um, a bunch of these valves had either rolled over keeper grooves, which is pretty normal when you install a beefier spring with a unmachined valve lock. The uh, geometry of this groove isn't all that great, so it'll tend to push on the uh, corner of this groove and roll it over. This is going to be shown in the uh, valve removal. A lot of times you'll push this, try to pull this through the guide, and it'll actually uh, grab. It'll get stuck on the top of the valve guide, and you'll, you'll have a hard time pulling it out without damaging the inside of the guide. Uh, a lot of guys will pull the, guy, the valve all the way through and just wiggle its way out, but that ends up dragging material and causing damage. Really what you need to do is you need to pull the valve back out of its hole. I like to use these diamond files. They're meant for sharpening knives while you're out fishing. Then all you do is you grab the valve with one hand, file the keeper groove with the other, and just rotate the valve as you're uh, deburring, and then eventually you'll be able to knock down the burrs and pull the valve out without damaging the seal and damaging the uh, the inside of the guide bore. Then another thing that I noticed, and this will be this will be something that you'll run into in a lot of production style cylinder heads, you know, where they're, they're selling dozens of these at a time. A lot of times there's cleanliness issues. These things get pushed through the process pretty fast. I noticed that not only was there nice clean oil in here, but there was also a lot of uh, abrasive debris from the valve guide machining still left inside of the guides and it actually dripped down with the oil the motor oil that was used for assembly and it just collected right there at the end of the valve guide you know that's all grit and abrasive uh and little bits of little tiny bits of bronze um, that should have been removed but if all you're doing is washing your heads in a jet wash and not physically brushing out all your guides it's pretty likely that you're still going to have some grit and abrasive still left in the uh, guide bores. Would this have been a problem? Probably not, but it does leave you open to, uh, to a little bit of risk. It's certainly not good. And I said these are supposed to come with SI valves, which is the original supplier for Raylar. Uh, except the exhaust valves are SI. They say it right on the valve stem. It's kind of hard to see, but... It says SI valves right there. This is a later model uh, Raylar head. I mean, let's see. This is serialized 1825. So it's pretty late in the run. One of the most recent heads that he sold. This has a little triangle. I don't know if I can catch that on camera. 
I'm not sure what this supplier is. I think it's PEP, but but my entire time in industry, I've never used PEP valves, so I don't. I'm not familiar with what they look like. I know they're in Vegas. They supply a lot of people. I'm sure it's a perfectly good valve. I've just never used them before. A little interesting thing, because I, I know that SI Valve still has his intake valves in stock, so I'm not sure why they're buying PEP valves or whatever brand this is uh, for their intake side, but a little, little odd to me. And then there's a close shot at the keepers that come in these heads. That's just a cheap little... 10 cent stamped uh, valve lock. I don't know that they're even hardened. Uh, my my impression is, is if it's not a machined valve lock, it's probably not going to be hardened. Then lastly, these are non-adjustable rocker studs. Shouldn't be something you want to run on a Raylar head, but if that's your thing, by all means. I wouldn't do it. Or maybe I would. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can be pretty cheap sometimes. You should probably be buying adjustable guide plates that are hardened and uh, putting a better rocker stud into this. I mean, let's go take a look. Let's see if I've got a 7 16 rocker stud sitting in here. There's a stalker. Uh, do I have one? Maybe. Maybe I don't. Aha! I do. In the junk drawer. Everyone has one. If you're a real hoarder like me. You're gonna have one. One is more better than the other. I'd rather have that. But, you know, we got a 10 millimeter thread there and a 7 16 thread there. Whoa! Monster tight and even sealed. So those were torqued and uh, installed permanently. It makes it a little more difficult. You know, if the bolt's tight, then it's gonna gonna probably lean the guy towards using the original fastener. I think so. Ripping them out with an impact is uh, a little bit too much work for the average user. Ah, the ear death. I like a little pain. And it's hilarious. Some of you guys really like the uh, the in-law storyline. How much of that is true? I'll leave that up to you. We've all got imaginations. Time! Do I get an award? And I'm just gonna throw those there. All right, so, show. Nicely machined rocker pads. All of this is pretty much the same setup. So if I do one, I'm probably gonna do every single Raylar head that I have. The CP fixture has provisions to use that head bolt as well as that head bolt. Um, so it's gonna bolt right onto the fixture without needing any additional setup other than your first one. Uh, the machine's already ready. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and drill and tap these holes. Then I'll roll it over and drill and tap those holes. You should be really nice to that head, you're going to scratch the surface. We don't use factory surfaces in actual machine shops or any real performance setting. New castings like to relax. When you go through and port the heads, especially if this is one of the first machine, especially if the decking is one of the first machine operations, by the time you've ported it, shoved guides in, done all your machining, this head's going to move around. It's not going to be flat. Removing all this material is going to relieve a lot of st tension that's stored inside of the part. You'll add some twist to the to the deck. Is that going to be a problem once you bolt it onto the engine? Probably not, but do you want to open yourself up to risk? Uh, I don't know. I like to be risky. Um, ask any woman that I've dated. But with engines, eh, that can be a little expensive. So let's just uh, let's not take a risk. We'll put a fresh skim cut on this. We'll do that off camera. I don't want to bore you. Nice CNC porting. The uh, lead on this valve guide is quite long, and I happen to be a fan of that. Um, oh, hey, look at that. That's something new. That is anti-seize on the valve guide. I've seen people do that. I'm not a fan. It's a little messy. 
Except I do use ARP lube to press in guides sometimes. That's about all it's good for. But I'll take the time to clean all the excess off. I wouldn't leave it on the, uh, on the valve guide. Uh, instead of ARP lube, I'll use this stuff. This is the, uh, this is the business. If you're a professional, you're probably using this. For the home gamer, I'd probably get a bottle of that anyways. Or a little squeeze tube. Manly sells it. You can buy it online. That's better than ARP lube. Uh, you're seeing a lot of rod manufacturers uh, use that on the rod bolts instead of ARP lube now. Uh, the only manufacturer I've seen that hasn't switched over would be Eagle. Uh, and then Carrillo also uses their own special lube, but a lot of people just use a CMD. Uh, you can use that on head bolts as well. Uh, when the engine runs, that stuff melts and it runs down the side of the engine. Looks a little bit cleaner. It's a lot less uh, messy than ARP lube, and it's oil soluble. Uh, ARP lube is, it will get uh, mixed in with their oil. It's not a big deal, but it, it is a solid. Uh, you know, that molybdenum disulfide is uh, great at high pressure situations, but it can be known to be abrasive in uh, tight clearance situations. So I, you know, it's it's been the standard for decades, but CMD, that's slowly taken over that uh, ARP lube, especially in a prof professional setting. So, you know, I've got dozens and dozens of the ARP packets. So I've got one of these little containers and I've got a little brush. I, I, I actually use that for uh, tapping these days and it happens to be pretty good for that. A little less messy than like a Tap Magic or a uh, or WD-40 or, you know, something something wet and slimy. Now, I happen to have a couple of these cross sections of a Raylar head. Uh, these were used for testing early on. They're not really relevant these days, but here's a good idea of what an older Raylar head will look like. Um, this is modified. Uh, I don't think that's how they come now. Uh, they were trying to come up with something that was uh, going to work in a big power situation. But this is an older casting. They've added a little bit of thickness around the uh, valve seat areas. Uh, especially back here and in these areas, there were some runs where the uh, seat pocket ran real deep, a lot deeper than this, and then they'd uh, try to make babies with the coolant passages uh, right in this area. And sometimes they did make babies. And they were bad babies. So we had to fix those every once in a while. Uh, the cross section in the pockets were a little bit thin here as well. I do know that this is pretty relative to what the castings look these days. Um, this is modified from here on, so um, th they do have a little bit more cross section in this area. Um, if you wanted to do something a uh, little on the hardcore side on these heads as far as porting, uh, you'd have to weld up the top of the port, which is really common if you're going to do a really nice uh, raised port deal. Uh, if I wanted to play with these from scratch, I'd probably raise this port up with some epoxy and try to go upward. There's a few different ways you could approach this situation. Uh, the exhaust ports are pretty healthy as well, so there's plenty of room to play here. Uh, these ports were designed by Darren Morgan originally. Um, I'm pretty sure that they've made some revisions to the Darren Morgan port since then. Because uh, whenever I've had these on my flow bench, they do whistle quite loudly, um, and they are a little turbulent. So I don't think that the current rendition of the Raylar head is exactly what what Darren designed uh, 20 years ago. Now here we go. Got a couple of these. It's a V12 uh, Ferrari 456. This is a 1999 model, so that would be a 456M. That's a 5.5 liter V12. They're dual everid cams. They use a shim over bucket adjustment that's pretty similar to a Toyota. Uh, the valves are nice and special. They're a 374 valve stem, uh, and then the on the intake and then the exhaust measure uh, 374.3. Uh, they're a little bit uh, larger on the exhaust side. Uh, this thing had about 19,000 miles. It belongs to a friend of mine. He owns a machine shop. Uh, he tore this thing down and kind of got in over his head. The guide removal on a Ferrari is a little abnormal compared to other engines. Uh, the guides tend to get locked into place. Uh, they're a sintered bronze. Sintered parts tend to have oil impregnated within the part. Uh, so when they go through heat cycles, a lot of that oil permeates out of the uh, part and then locks the locks the valve guide or locks the valve seat into place. Um, and it can make it a little high risk as far as removal is concerned. 
Uh, he looked at it, put a couple good hits on some of the on the uh, valve guides, got a little sketched out, um, and started asking around to some friends of ours in town. Three other machinists said no to this. I don't blame them. Um, I looked on eBay, and these are about nine thousand dollars a pair to uh, buy some used heads. So. But for most guys, that'll ruin you. I happen to be pretty comfortable with remov removing valve guides on a Ferrari, as well as installing and sizing them. Um, so it's within my realm. So I told him, yeah, I'll help you out, but you should have called me first. You knew you should have called me. But I don't blame you. So at 19,000 miles, you say, hey, that's, uh, that's a brand new car. In Ferrari terms, that's pretty low mileage, but they tend to have uh, valve guide issues. I... I'm a pretty firm believer that the Europeans in the 80s and 90s did a little bit more experimentation than they had any business doing as far as materials were concerned. Uh, a centered bronze guide is pretty abnormal to use, uh, in, especially in a full bronze material. Um, I'm sure there was some reasons why they went with a centered bronze. I'm sure they've got some exotic, very toxic beryllium mixed in with it, but... Uh, we're gonna knock those out and get that taken care of in the next video. Apparently, when it started up, especially as of late, you know, roll into it and leave a nice cloud of smoke behind them. And this is what you're up against. That's about ten thousandths of clearance or so. There's the next hole, that's about three thousandths. Uh, and it varies from guide to guide. There's no doubt that this thing was consuming oil there's another really bad one you know not only do they have some abnormal removal procedures the install procedures are a little strange you've got to have some special tools instead of being a nice straight valve guide like this and this would be pretty standard for an import cylinder head anyways this is pretty standard anybody can handle that but ferrari likes to Add extra steps for maybe no particular reason. There are some nice features here, but you know the only standard thing here is the valve guide diameter itself, and then the seal is machined for a standard European seal. Um, in fact, this shares a, a valve stem seal with uh, most VWs that have a uh, seven millimeter stem. This flange needs to seat inside of a taper on the top side of the cylinder head. Uh, they've got tapers built into the nose of the valve guide as well as undercuts and then this flange which is what you're supposed to uh, tap on uh, you can't use the top of the seal area to tap the guide down um, that's usually where you're going to mess up um, and a lot of people are only set up to tap on the top of the valve guide um, i happen to have the special tools to install these valve guides uh, let's go see if we can find them inside of my toolbox here we go right here. So here we are, this is my special Ferrari valve guide installer. You know, these are really hard to get. They're a lot of money. Uh, it's designed to locate on the top of the valve guide here, which is 11 millimeters. Uh, I'm not sure why this says 7 16 on it, but uh, it's, uh, it's probably American made. Probably means that it's a nice product. Uh, this chamfer here is very important. Uh, that way you don't smash the top of the casting when you go to tap the guide down. Uh, because this, the top of this step is actually captured by, uh, by a spring locator. Um, and it helps prevent the guide from falling up out of the cylinder head. It also, this flange also prevents the guide from falling down into the port as well. Uh, not that they'd fall out because these things go in with a boatload of press. Now that's what you'd expect to see on a Ferrari cylinder head. Uh, you can see that this flange sits down below and uh, below flush and it sits down inside of a hole. If you look down in that hole you can see that the guide needs to sit down below flush to the spring pocket. Um, that's pretty abnormal. Um, this you, you wouldn't run into that on anything else other than a Ferrari cylinder head. Um, there are some straight up race cylinder heads that you'll see in the drag racing world that use a design like that. Uh, but that's why you've got to have this chamfer. Without that chamfer, you'd be able to drive the guide down to at least flush with the spring pocket, but then you'll uh, smash the top of the spring pocket and the guide won't be down all the way. Um, then you'll run into risk of a retainer to seal issue. Um, you know, this, the guide install itself isn't rocket science, but you're not going to use air tools on something like this. 
the guides go out by hand they go in by hand uh, if you use a uh, air hammer to drive your guides in and out on this you are going to lose any amount of feel and feedback that you might have by uh, doing it by hand and if something's wrong you're not really going to know the air hammer's got quite a lot more force and it's more efficient at uh, driving guides in and out than uh, your regular arm with a hammer and a hand driver if a mercedes v12 came in and you had to replace the guides. It's probably about a three-hour job to remove and replace the guides and size them. Um, on a Ferrari, you've got all of eight hours to remove and replace the valve guides if you know what you're doing. Uh, it's not an easy process. Most of the time, you've got to actually uh, machine most of the valve guide out of the bore, and you machine the guide till it's just a little thin... Uh, basically sleeve and you're going to remove all the press before you can even bother tapping the guide out of its hole. Um, most shops aren't comfortable doing that on something this rare and exotic. So enough of that. So it can be a little strange to be that guy that the machine shops call. You know, I'm just a guy in his garage and all I've got is that lowly bridge port. But if you, if you want to know about my qualifications, um, I am wearing Rick and Morty socks. You know, the uh, if that's not enough, then I don't know what is. So what you just watched me do is I set the head up in the fixture and I squared it up front to back using a wrist pin. This is a ground surface. The ends of the wrist pins typically are not. They're usually just lathe turns. So you're not ever going to know whether or not the machined OD of the wrist pin is going to be perpendicular to the sides. Uh, so what I did was I ground the uh, one of the ends perpendicular to the OD of the wrist pin. Um, so now this is my tool that I'll use for indicating in off of rocker stands. Um, and then I'll be able to reference off of this surface as opposed to going off of the threads that were machined or anything along those lines. I figure that the machine surface would be the most, the, the most accurate way of picking up on a uh, rocker stand, uh, especially on a big block Chevy where they already come in machined. Um, in a perfect world, the threads should be machined on the same plane as the, uh, as the rocker stand itself but a lot of times if the heads have been worked on before you're not going to run into that typical seat and guide machines are only going to indicate using a bubble level um, in the bridge port i can use a bubble level if i wanted to but it's not going to give you the degree of accuracy that uh, using an actual dial indicator or a test indicator would give you um, i do you will see me use a bubble level from time to time uh, especially when I set up on a pilot to cut a valve seat, uh, I'll use the bubble level to get me really close and then I'll swap over to the dial indicator to uh, indicate in and get everything square and true. So that, that's going to be one of the benefits to using a bridge port. These machines are actually meant to do real machining. Uh, seat and guide machines are meant to uh, speed up the machining process in an automotive setting. Uh, it's, it's really convenient and adds to profitability in a lot of machine shops where you're trying to get a bunch of jobs in and out of the, in and out of the door real fast. Uh, but in a performance setting where the speed uh, turnaround isn't necessarily the, your number one priority, accuracy and quality is going to be a, a, a larger priority than actual speed. Uh, you're going to see people using bridge ports and a CP fixture or a rollover fixture like this. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of comments now that my channel's getting a hell of a lot larger. Seeing a lot of people. Uh, making claims that you can't use a bridge port for automotive machining. But if you see those kinds of comments, kind of just chalk it up to inexperience. Uh, a lot of people just don't live in the, uh, in the performance realm. They kind of dabble in it here and there. But a lot of people that are doing higher end machine work, you're going to see them do a lot of their processes in, in a bridge port or a milling machine. There's just a lot of things that a seat and guide machine cannot do uh, that a bridge port has no problem doing and that's what it's designed to do. Like this where you can, I can actually manipulate the angles of my rocker stand if I wanted to. 
Um, a lot of aftermarket heads have the uh, rocker studs machined at the incorrect angle. There's some Cleveland heads that have that issue or some 460 heads that have that issue. A seating guide machine would really struggle to make uh, corrections like that. And most seating guide machines use an air float table. Uh, it, and that adds to speed of setup because you can just use the tool to self-center using the air floating table. Everything on a bridge port is rigid. Um, so I've actually got to use my uh, digital readout to go off of coordinates that I already have set. On a seating guide machine, since it uses a floating table, uh, you're going to go over and it's going to center off of the original hole. So if that hole wasn't machined uh, on the correct bore spacing, you're going to follow that incorrectly uh, machined hole. Uh, so it may, may or may not be correct. It's really up to whoever machined the head originally. So to go from 10 millimeter to 7 16 I've got to drill this oversized. Uh, the, the tap drill diameter for 7 16 would be uh, 368, I believe. I don't have one of those drills, so I'm going to use a, uh, a 358 drill, which would be 21 64 I believe. Nope, 23 64 uh, That x That 10 thousandths undersized, eh, what's 10 thousandths between friends? It's just a drill hole. So 358, that'll work just fine here. Um, I should be using the next size up, but I think it's a letter size or a number size. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, this will work just fine. I've already got a good idea of where center is going to be. Uh, I've got the DRO set up using a previous setup on a different set of heads. Uh, so it should be pretty close here. Just by eye, I'm coming in and just making sure that the twist drill isn't deflecting one way or another and it isn't and I've got the DRO indicated at uh, 4 inch 839 a thousandth I think we can let that go so this looks pretty centered the original setup was, is repeatable from head to head so everything's locked down I'm gonna go and drill all these threads out there's still gonna be a remnant of the old thread left over uh, that Ideally, we'd be going two sizes up. Uh, 7 16 is pretty similar to 11 millimeter. Uh, so since we're not going two sizes up, you'll see some of the original uh, 10 millimeter threads left over. But with the material that we're going to remove uh, when we go to tap it, it ends up being just fine anyways. Uh, and a lot of people in the comments, I find this a little strange, a lot of people in the comments uh, get real freaked out that I... Uh, I'll do a lot of operations dry, or they actually physically don't see any lube being uh, sprayed on the cylinder heads. Um, if you're cons if you're just dousing the heads in uh, WD-40, all it does it just adds the uh, it adds to the mess. It's more stuff you got to deal with. Your hands get really dirty, um, and that's how you end up with machine shops that you know have machines that are just covered in filth and oil. You know, I'm, I'm pretty particular about how I keep my machines. You know, I mop the floors two or three times a week. I might try to wipe this thing down once a week. There's some shops that I've been to where you touch the machines and you end up with these gross black smudges all over them, uh, all over your hands. So it's not something that you like to see in a machine shop. You know, this is my house. I do want to keep things pretty sanitary in here. Um, and another thing, uh, if if I sit there, do a machine operation, I'll have a pile of chips in one in one little spot. It's not time efficient to go through and vacuum up every single pile of chips, uh, especially when you've got to do four or eight different setups. Um, a lot of times I'm going to, when it's a drilling or a simple machining operation like this, I'm going to go through, um, machine all my holes and then vacuum up uh, all the piles of chips at the same time, as opposed to uh, uh, blowing them off and getting them all over the floor or vacuuming the chips up every single time. It's just a preference. Uh, it's, it's not a problem. It's not a problem if you want to vacuum up your chips every time you uh, do an operation, but that's just not the way I do things. So you can see some of the old threads are still left over. I, I need to go a little bit deeper. Um, I just reached the bottom of the original hole. I'm gonna go about a half inch deeper beyond this. Uh, 
uh, going a little bit deeper than the original hole uh, will allow us to use a little bit longer of a stud. But it gives you a little bit more support if you uh, have got quite a lot more spring pressure than these heads were intended to uh, be set up for. So now that I'm set up here, all I gotta go and do is move over, machine the other three holes, and then I'll switch over to a tap, and then I'll go and walk through power tapping with you guys. Uh, this would be the same operation if you had a small block Chevy or a small block Ford. A lot of times I'll have pressed in rocker studs. You'll have to remove the rocker studs, uh, machine the top of the rocker stands down uh, to make room for the hex on the screw and stud. So if this, if this stand was two inches tall, for example, and it didn't already have threads in it, I would have to machine it a little bit shorter to compensate for this extra height here that the uh, hex is going to add. Um, there are some uh, screw-in studs that don't have a hex and they're just installed using a double nut method or using a stud installer. Um, I don't use those. Those are meant for the rebuilder world. And they're kind of geared towards guys who have uh, rocker studs that are pulling out of their cylinder heads in the vehicle. Um, I don't recommend tapping your rocker studs by hand or in the vehicle, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. So this, for example, would be approximately maybe 425 tall, and then I'd just go up to the top of that radius. So if I'd either machine the top of the stand to that 425 number or go, ju or go just a little bit beyond that to... Uh, uh, also take the guide plates into consideration where a lot of stock cylinder heads aren't going to have guide plates. A lot of uh, small block Fords and small block Chevys are going to have slots in the cylinder heads to guide the push rods. Big block Chevys use guide plates from the factory. Small block Chevys and small block Fords a lot of times don't and they'll use the slots to locate the push rod. When you machine for a screw and stud, a lot of times you're going to drill those slots out round and then you'll switch to a guide plate setup. So you would add this uh, 425 number in addition to the thickness of your guide plate, which a lot of times would be about an eighth inch or so. All right, so now the last hole is drilled. We're gonna, whoa, monster tight. We're going to switch over to a tap. Uh, I've got a spiral fluted tap. This thing's been around the block a little while. It's a little on the dull side. I need to go order a new one. This style will draw the chips out in a big long uh, sliver as opposed to little tiny chips like this. Uh, that'll help prevent it from uh, packing up and locking into place and breaking. I'm going to put this in the chuck. I'll run it down and let it bottom out. You're not supposed to bo bottom out taps in their holes. Um, I'm going to time it to where I kill the... Uh, kill the spindle motor off at the same time it, that it's going to bottom out and then I'll be able to set my stop. Once I've got the quill stop set up, uh, I'll be able to shut the quill motor off and reverse uh, just in time before it bottoms out in the hole. Are there better ways to do it? I'm sure there are. I'm, I can probably just come in and measure with a caliper and go down to the bottom of the hole, but this is a little more interesting. It's a pretty practical manner of doing things not overly concerned with breaking off a tap in this head. So now one side's machined, it's pretty easy to swap over to machine the other side. Instead of rotating the head of the mill the other direction, I'm just going to take the head out of the fixture and I'm going to flip it 180 degrees. Um, and that's going to uh, orient me to machine the uh, rocker stands for the intake side.
All right. Now the fasteners don't have to be monster tight. It's not a competition. You're not really putting a whole load on a whole lot of load on the cylinder head when you're doing a drilling and tapping operation. So we're gonna eyeball that. Let's try the bubble level. Let's see if I can uh, use that to get me get me close. Most machine shops are gonna have some kind of homemade little uh, stud or some kind of pilot to set up their um, seat and guide machine using a uh, bubble level. It's not exactly the most accurate way of doing things, especially when your threads are a little on the sloppy side. And we just got to indicate off of this and repeat the same process. I just found this inside of the other box. Some handwritten notes. That's nice. And then some torque specs. Do it over torque. Cool. Same thing with the ARP bolts and a Ziploc. It's a hole in it. Perfect. All right, something isn't making sense here. That's an SI valve. That's the, what I think is a PEP valve. One is not like the other. So you got two different intake valves in the same pair. Is that a big deal? No, but it's... Uh, Infuriating. Frustrating. No, I just stepped inside to go have an early breakfast, but before anyone goes and tries to tell me that this is fake, here we are. Serial number 1824. Still on the same setup. Serial number 1825. Well, that's a little disappointing. One more little thing. Rust. These springs are covered in a bunch of oil, too. I don't understand how they got rusty, but no, that's not something I want to see. That'll cause a spring failure. And there you go, guys. That's how you do a 716 rocker stud conversion in 8.1 Chevys. You know, this doesn't only apply to the Raylar heads. It also applies to standard 
HP3 heads, dart heads, anything that's got this conventional pattern. They're all going to come with a 10 millimeter thread. That's really beefy. That's going to work out just fine. If you've got upgraded pressures or just want to keep your valve train alive, keep your engine alive, this is one of the best upgrades that you can do on an 8.1. So that's it. Uh, I decided not to monetize the channel until after the first of the year. So you're going to get to enjoy all the content, all my videos ad free until the first. So that's going to be cool. Uh, next time you see me, we're going to have the Ferrari up on the bench and That'll be a really fun video. It's gonna be really detailed. You don't see a whole lot of uh, Ferrari rebuild videos online, uh, especially one <laughs> that's being done inside of a two-car garage. This is gonna be exactly what I'm trying to do with this channel, and we're just gonna showcase that even with very limited equipment, you can do a very high-end job. Um, and it's just gonna show you that, you know, if you know what to look for, you're gonna be able to find yourself a really good machinist. Most of us are trying to do the best that we can, you know, with some education through myself and some of the through some of the other creators, you're going to be able to walk in with some amount of knowledge and hopefully save yourself from ending up in a bad situation. Or even ideally, you'll be able to uh, build a relationship with a good machinist and you'll have a very good experience working on your own engines. Um, and even some of you might be comfortable with tackling, tackling some of the uh, machining processes yourself. I still plan on doing a Porsche 944 how-to series and I'll go through and show you the, exactly how I built these 944 heads for years. Uh, these are very popular cylinder heads. It's a very popular platform. Most of these are out there broken or abused. So the, the engines more than likely have to come apart if you're looking for a Porsche 944. It's not really a very complicated platform. You'll be able to go out and maybe show it to your machinist, or even if you're brave enough, you can go and tackle some of the porting or some of the processes yourself at home. So let's do our best. Let's try to hit 20,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Uh, this is gonna be a really fun project. I can't wait to see you guys. Hopefully by the weekend, I'll have this taken care of. Uh, if you can make it for the Premiere, that would be fun. I love interacting with you guys. Uh, I looked at some of the analytics. A lot of you guys aren't subscribed. Go ahead, subscribe. We've got some really cool stuff planned. I'd love to have you guys join us. Uh, this is really growing faster than I ever could have imagined. All that being said, I'd say this is a good place to put a pin in it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Uh, this is Josh at Engine Rehab, and maybe I'll catch you by the weekend. We'll be doing Ferrari things.